Come here. Listen, you need to hear this. When they say you're getting sent to prison, it's not only you that goes, your family goes with you. I'm like, come on, man, you can't be doing this because it's either you're going to stab someone or you're going to get stabbed yourself. He was holding his neck and then he showed them, he was like, I got stabbed. And he was just walking and talking and then he dropped. What I want desperately is my boy to be alive. I don't want anything else. I just want my boy to be, to be alive. It's all mad. Children are wild now. This is about me and my friends. It's about being young and black in East London. It's about a place called Eastside and a man called Ray. Ray understands us. He does what he can for us in his way. It's hard and sometimes for us, his way is the only way. All the time in our areas, there is knife and gun problems. I was talking to Eric Kamali yesterday, um, you know, the number of weapons in Hackney and, and others, a lot of it, 80% plus, is black on black. The most I heard is that when he trips, they left him stabbed in his neck and he got hit in the head of a hammer. My boy is an innocent boy. He's not from gang, he's, he doesn't know nothing about drugs. David is a baby. He's a, he's a baby. It could happen to anybody. It could happen to anybody. That is why something has to be done quick. Uh, one of my close friends, um, two weeks ago, um, was stabbed and shot him in the bush. People are desensitised to killing. They're desensitised to um, feeling that real grief when somebody when somebody dies because they see it as run of the mill. Someone else got stabbed like two weeks ago. Not the one in Beckton? No, that was strapped. I might have been in Beckton, but I know the girl was strapped. Not the one who was killed? No, 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 it was on last no. We have to take some responsibility because it's our generation that has allowed this to happen. So we need to think about where we have gone wrong in um, bringing up our children. When people catch a flu virus, it can get passed on very quickly, or it can just disappear. Or it can get to a point where it's just infected a lot of people and it's not really going to go. And in a way, that's the way I see it. Like, you can't really control what's going to happen. It's all of our problem. This problem permeates the whole of society. Black boys, are they dangerous? Are they just difficult? Is it about single parents? Is it about the environment? Is it about the council estates? What is it about? This this area is like our territory. And if other people come and want to try and abuse it, you kind of feel offended. So as a result, most people just get angry and just lash out. Right, an estate got a name, another estate's got a name. Problems start yeah. over. Dumbness, money, anything. Yeah. No, 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 no. From there, it just goes on. Mm -hmm. Generation after generation, don't stop. That's what I've done. You can't really just walk into someone's area and expect like, to just walk through without something happening because they feel that you're violating them. You can't, this is theirs. The street is not owned by anybody. Why are they fighting because of postcode? I live in Sodok now. A boy in Kambawe cannot go to Peckham. A boy in London Bridge cannot go to Waterloo. A boy in Waterloo cannot come to Elephant and Castle. This is ridiculous. Someone is bound to get stabbed in it. Oh, for this little beef in it. Can cast some out some plaster, Stratford, East Ham. But East Ham, bless their beef with them. It's Beckton, Manor Park, Ilford, all them ends. It's got beef with Castle Mouse, and Castle Mouse is not playing it right. If you get called back for beef, you've got to come in. You have to? Yeah. What happens? This is your area, you live here. Please, like, say, the person coming to your yard, you run up in your yard, say, so you're going to protect your area, you're going to protect your house. 
they're out for me the same way I'm out for them now, car. Obviously, if you if you want to stop the problems, they're not they're not ready to stop the problems. So you have to just live by you, boy. Same shit, different days. Let me. Reputation, that's the main key. And that's what everyone wants nowadays. Everyone wants reputation. Everyone wants to be known as a bad boy. Oh yeah, I'm a bad man. I'm a gangster, blah, 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 blah. Money is involved and often, oftentimes it's a lot of money, like the stakes are higher. So that's why a lot of things happen the way they do. And you see it all over the news and stuff like stabbings or shootings. And it's basically because of money. Like, people don't have a lot of it, so they, uh, they protect what they have. Do you guys have dreams about how, what you'd like to do when you're older or how you'd like to get out of this? Not really. Obviously, we've got ambitions. We want to go places. We don't want to be here forever. What are your ambitions? I want to be working, innit? I want to be an electrician. Do you? Mm. No, I don't have no ambitions. I talk to the boys, and a lot of them, they ain't even got hope that, oh, they can't do this, oh, they can't be bothered with that. And it's all because like, they're black boys. They just, oh, forget it. Forget looking for a job. We won't get a job anyway. So then they'd hang the streets. They think committing crime is a quick way to earn money. But it's, you know, so many of these young kids that take that route, it doesn't last very long. You know, they're either a victim of a serious crime themselves or they go to prison, um, you know, or, or uh, ultimately they get killed. If you choose to go down that road, the same thing will happen to you. And it's happened to so many um, others. We need to teach them about crime, about to say no to crime, about to love each other. It's about love. They mustn't see each other as, as, as a rival. I was talking to a teacher in a school recently, and she said to me, Ray, in my mind, our black boys are in the dock. And she said, but I'm not sure if they should be in the dock. She said, I wonder whether or not in the dock should be the schools, should be the police, should be the politicians, should be the parents. Who is to blame, she said. And I suggested to her that it was easier to blame others than to find solutions. Yeah, there's lots of people around there taller than me, but I'm older than them. Eastside Young Leeds Academy has been running now for eight years. We work in the London Borough of Newham uh, with black boys at risk of exclusion. This is the last chance saloon, and a lot of schools have said, your son's going to be excluded unless he joins the academy because we don't know what else to do with him. Three things. First of all, welcome to the guy who looks like David Bellamy. He's an archaeology student. Um, I know he looks a bit fucked up, but don't worry about it for the time being, you know what I mean, because he's all right. Then we've got a guy here who's related to the shoe bomber, um, some Ibrahim Akbar Hussein, whatever, you know what I mean? I don't know. But you know what, we're not, we're not people of prejudice, are we, boys? We're not prejudiced people. We embrace all comers. The boys come to us after school as well as the holidays. And what we do is we help them with their schoolwork, with homework, we mentor them, we help them with their personal issues, family life and similar. Life occurs in many shades of grey. And we even manage to get some boys scholarships to some of the top private schools in the country. And I'm really pleased and proud of that. It's really important that we get the boys as young as possible so they can start getting their life going in the right direction without too much effort. We accept boys into our academy who are supposedly uh, troublemakers, seen by some in the school system as being boys who cause problems. What I see are young men with great potential who are not using it in the right way. You remember that? You remember what we learned last year? Yeah. What we do at Eastside is that we show them that they can retain their personalities, that same energy, that same drive, and turn it into being positive citizens. When you're playing football and you start to get angry, that means you are now 
becoming not in control of yourself. How does that make you feel? I'm quite um, upset because I'm I'm the one that's um, I'm the one that's I'm, not, I'm living that life and I want to like change it all and I feel upset because I need to know how to change. It. The majority of the 100-plus boys attending Eastside are on track, doing better at school, keeping out of trouble, and it works because they join us when they're as young as eight or nine and then stay with us through to 18. They get angry, Omari. I would want to kind of hit home to people in power that we really can make a difference by preventing rather than waiting till it's all gone wrong and then putting heaps of money into something that's going to cost a lot more. Um, they're kind of like teaching us how to control our temper. Yes. So you know the next time you get angry, remember what I said. Then you can all become like me. That's why they call me sensei. Yes, yeah, sir. Put it there. Did you hear that? Say that loud. So that it... Black boy, one parent, very bright. One of the brightest boys in the school. One day coming home from school with his friend, somebody starts troubling his friend, he sticks up for his friend. Next day, he's got gang after him. So his mother takes him to school and picks him up for three months. All of a sudden he says, yeah, you don't need to pick me up anymore, Mum, I'm OK. You know why? because he decides to, to join his, his in-school gang to get the protection. They says, oh, we'll look after you, but then starts getting into bad company. Well, uh, he was in court the other day. There's a boy that, you know, you wouldn't expect a really, really charming, bright boy, and all that because he sticks up for his friend while he's walking down the street, you know? single mother, having had two brothers who served time behind bars, uh, having seen countless friends end up in prison, my first cousin, um, and numerous school friends of mine, uh, etc. I felt that EYLA was somewhere in my DNA. I'm the right number! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yes, seven, eight, 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 eight. Why are you scratching? Get that, give me five push-ups. It's not push-ups. You've been watching too many dogs have sex, boy. Stay straight. Straighten your damn arms. Straighten them up. In all my seven years, I've never seen a more miserable, sorry bunch of black boys as you. I accept that our methods may be considered controversial, uh, but that's who I am. Uh, certainly back in 2008 when I hit the headlines, having to resign from being Deputy Mayor of London. Why is your hair so high, boy? You look weird anyway, and that does not help. July 4th, 2008, I stepped down as Deputy Mayor for youth. Uh, having worked for probably just a couple of months under Boris Johnson's um, tenure as mayor. Um, it was an incredibly difficult time. Um, and um, for the record, I stood down. I wasn't pushed. What happened and how it happened is something of a blur. Don't look at me! Partly because I, in part, hid my head under the blanket. But for the rest of my life, I carried the scars and I walked with a limp as a consequence of this incredible wrestling match that I had. Are you bored at hearing my voice? Do you secretly entertain the idea that you want to tell me to fuck off? <laughs> Is that what you want to do? Because I can take it, son, just say it. <laughs> I am who I am, and you can't drive out human nature with a pitchfork. And I am always going to remain the outspoken, 
um, maverick guy and fuck it, I've just got to do it. No I've got lives to save. But generally speaking, you know that if you're working with Ray Lewis, it's going to be one hell of a ride, believe you me. You're not a bad boy. Are you free to come over with me? Are you? No, I don't understand what this means. Use your voice. Be proud. Have you ever heard of tough love? <coughs> Do you know what it Make means? Make sure the person next to you is taller than you. It means Make sure the person next to you is taller I'm than you. I'm prepared to die for you. All right? I'm going to bring out the best in you. Isn't that nice of me? Huh? Huh? Welcome to the Academy. Go and enjoy yourself. So you understand me, sir? We have something about us that children actually respect, you know, and um, we build on them having respect for us because once they've got respect for us, it makes everything else easier. What are you laughing at? You need to cut out that lawless laugh here. You're not in the Jamaica market. Do you understand me? Unlike other organizations, they go in there, they play pool, but they don't have that sort of physical connection and the drills. The drills bring structure in their lives. Teach them how to walk as men. Teach them how to stand up, how to be brave, how to be confident. We're an academy, do you understand that? Look at me when I'm talking to you, young man. Put your hands to your side. I said to my mum, what, what have they got me doing here? Like, you know, they got me doing drills, like this is army. What you looking at? Get that, give me 10. You get that, give me 10. When they explained it to me, it's trying to get us into being a man, how we can be more masculine and how we can be more you know, positive towards life. Crime and what you might call the alternative economy is just right there near our boys and a lot more immediate than GCSEs and university and all the stuff associated with delayed gratification. This afternoon, one of our new boys was arrested on suspicion of attempted robbery. I'm gonna pick him up. This young man has been at his side for about two and a half weeks, so he's new to us. Um, and I think that um, it's fair to say that uh, we're still learning about him. And by the looks of things, he's still learning about himself. The boy is only 13 years old and police have been holding him for six hours already. Was it a shock? No. no. It wasn't a shock to you at all, son? Um, not really. So when a woman said to you, I'm arresting you and so on and so forth, that didn't phase you or anything? Um, no, nothing to worry about. I just shaked my head. Um, this isn't uh, a case of um, take this pill and come back and see me in two weeks. This is one that's got to play out. And we've got to move together. I think eventually I've got to lead him in the direction of his own waywardness so that he meets himself coming down the road. I think one of the things that will be quite effective is if his dad begins to turn uh, and, and begins to, to define for him what's right and wrong. You see, a father validates a boy. Um, and he's desperate for his dad's validation. And so I, I didn't get from his dad anything um, last week that suggested his annoyance of his son being involved in this. It was all about the system, injustice, how you get around it, how you endure it. You know, here we go, another lesson. And whilst all those lessons are good, it's in part misses the point. And the point is, were you involved in a criminal act? Um, and if so, what do we do about this? How do we, how do we, we fix this? These boys are my sons, and the idea that I didn't do enough drives me. On that day, where were you? Are you sure 100%? Yeah. Then why on earth are they mentioning your name? Your name comes up more times than Cheryl Bloody Cole. 
don't bullshit me. I can't save your ass unless I know what's going on. Look at me. You're talking about con man here yourself. I don't know what got stolen. It was a phone, wasn't it? I don't know. So I can look this this cop in the eye and say, let me tell you something now. Yeah. My boy was not there. Yeah. yeah and you are confident. 100%. Okay, off you go to your class. We'll talk later. Right. He's, he, I mean, his home is war torn. The enmity between those two, a child finds himself in the middle, and there's nothing more important to a child's mental health than the way mum and dad relate. Nothing else. It, the way they treat that child individually is nothing compared to the way they treat one another, and people miss that all the time. I know parents who have huge stonking rows and they go out and buy their children chocolate or a PlayStation game or something, as if somehow that's going to be completely mad. How many of you live with your dads? How many of you live with your dads? Put your bloody hands up. Do you live with your dads? It's not one thing, there's a multitude of things. I mean, the first thing, I think we have to start with the family, the breakdown of the family, you know. African tradition takes a whole village to raise a child. Um, and today, that doesn't exist. But it needs to exist, you know. To get our black boys back, it needs to exist because one family trying to cope in a society of you know where there's a lot of disarray it's not it's not happening if you don't have a father to kind of guide you and try and lead you on the right path you don't really know you know what where you're gonna go so me personally when i was young i i, I needed my dad a lot you know when my brother was doing his own thing i wouldn't really have anyone to you know teach me and stuff like that so i really needed my dad a lot but then there was a time where he went away and I just went like wild. We're standing in the gap of fathers here. We're surrogate fathers if you want to look at it that way. The father, the touch that the boy never had, that connection, that emotional bonding. Other than love, I don't know of anything else to do. I can't go into the role of a man and, you know, all I know what to do is to talk and to, to nurture and to, and to care, you know? So, that other aspect of it, I don't know. And I think this is where we fall down as single parents, you know? Aaron is 15 and his mum is having problems with him. She's finding it difficult to handle him uh, and issues of discipline and so much so that she sent him to live with his aunt. Last week, unfortunately, Aaron was excluded from school for swearing. This is not untypical for some of our boys. He's got a tendency to go to his friends and stay out without communicating. So we had recent saga three days ago, three nights he slept out. I was on the verge of calling the police on the second night, sending him a text, let me know, I'm about to call the police, let me know if you're all right. What are you going to be doing? Why are you going there? Who is this friend? Where does he live? Does his mum know? Da, 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 da. These are the questions yeah. I ask. And that is the question of every parent, I believe, when you're looking out for the welfare of your child, you want to know where they're going, when they're going to come back. If his dad comes on the scene now, he would just say, Dad, I'm going so-and-so. And, -so. and, um, and he would, oh, that's it. No, not 20 interrogation like me. And that's what they don't like. And, and, and the things that um, East Side stand for, I, I fully support it, you know, because who knows where they can be if they're groomed, trained, nurtured, you know, who knows? At the moment, you're not with mum, are you with your aunt? My aunt, yeah. Well, why are you there? Because myself and my mum had a little bit of trouble. Between you two or outside of you two? Mainly regarding me, like, when I'm on the road and stuff like that. Like, police, trouble and stuff like that. Tell me about the swearing thing when you came to the class. It's like, you don't know that you're going to swear, but when you do it, yeah. it's like, you think, oh, damn, the teacher told me not to do that and I've just done it. 
That's childish. And when you become a man, Aaron, you put away childish things. It's not what you feel. Sometimes I feel like strangling my kids, you know what I mean, but I don't do it. Mm. Why? Because you recognise that it is greater, more important than how you feel. And if your life is not more important than how you feel, you will be a victim of your feelings for the rest of your life. Mm. You will fuck any girl that moves, you'll hit anybody that comes in your direction, you'll end up stealing what ain't yours, and your life goes on and on like that. Why? Because that is how you feel. That is no good, Aaron. That is no good. I think you probably frightened some of your teachers as well, Aaron. Yeah. You're a big lad, you're black, and you're not just black, but you're dark, you know, and... <laughs> no, 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 I'm telling you, would, would Obama got in if he looked like you? I doubt it. People have a, a, a more of a, you know, yeah, a stereotypical view of all black people. Well, not all black people, but black boys, that they're all aggressive and, you know, boisterous and stuff like that, and how they, um, um, tend to be more angry and things like that towards other people. Often, I think, schools don't understand the importance of culture and cultural differences that are in, inherently in children and the fact that, you know, a group of black boys might seem to be very vibrant, boisterous, excitable, um, inqu inquisitive and so on, and that might be seen as naughty behaviour when actually it is all of those other adjectives I described, you know, that um, they are generally just a, a lively bunch. The finish line is there, son. There it is. You can bloody see it. We're not even talking 18 months. We're not even talking a year. We're not even talking six months. There it is. There it is. All I need to do now is hold the fuck on. Now, I ain't asking you to hang on for the rest of your life. Three or four months. Tell me you can do that. I could do that. It's about everybody bringing up a child. Can you imagine if we all go out as parents looking out for the good of, of someone else's child and see that child doing something and we all say something, we all contribute. We wouldn't have this knife, this gun, but even in the home, parents are... Uh, uh, cooperating with the evil that the, the children are doing, you know, because they are benefiting from it monetary, you know. It goes on. It goes on. Yeah. Now, I said, put the parents in jail, not the child, you know. Over the years, I've um, increasingly recognised the importance of working with parents. There are so many of our parents under such extreme pressure. And some of our parents have become so battered. I was talking to one week before last. And I said to her, um, how long have you known your son has been selling drugs? and?" Um, credit cards. Your son is 14. His bedroom is something out of a Nike advert. There are trainers under his bed he's never worn. You must have known. And she goes, Ray, when you're in my position, you turn a blind eye. And she goes, after a while, I just stopped asking. So I said to her, when did you realise that you'd sold out? She went and asked him for £400 and he gave it to me. I said, OK. How, how are you doing? Not good. What's wrong? Please don't, please don't at me. Please police. Please arrested me yesterday. It's not about they don't like you, you gotta like yourself. So when they stop you, you ask them, yes sir, you know, let them see what Isad has been teaching you. You don't gotta get hostile with them because you know you haven't done anything wrong. And if you've done something wrong, apologize about it. That's well, the big If I know if I was in the wrong, I would apologize straight up, innit? Yeah. So I know when I'm in the wrong, if I've done something wrong, I'll apologize like, I say, yeah, but I didn't do anything, innit? Yeah, that was with a couple of players, they were kicking the can, trying to say, I kicked the can. You kicked the can? No, I didn't kick the can. So did you tell the officers you did? I told that, you know. And what they said? You tried to aggravate me, you tried to beat me up. So I walked off. 
But what's the approach that we teach you here? Shake their hands, look them eyeball to eyeball, and talk to them like a man. That's the approach that we teach you. That breaks down everything. It's all about your attitude. Attitude determines approach. Approach determines success or failure. And if you start grouping up like that and stuff, they're going to get all defensive. You, know what I mean? you see what I'm saying? I don't get stopped by police, yeah? The van, yeah, on the main road, I turned the light on. So I pulled over. I said, yes, officer, what, what can I do for you? Oh, um, is this your car? Hang on a minute. The bet is this my car? I said, if it wasn't my car, I wouldn't be in it. They was asking me what I do. I told them I work with kids that are on the street to try and make your job easier. I said, I work with kids that you lots are stopping every single day, yeah? But you know the funny thing about it, a big 50 year old man like me, if they can stop me thinking I may have drugs or whatever, you lot ain't got a chance, trust me. Chance. That's no. just the way it is. Mm. Yep, just avoid it like a plague, man. The boys who come here are off the streets and out of trouble. You take John, he used to be permanently on the streets. He was a road rat, as we used to call him. His life was rough. He's now part of our community. He's a bright lad. He looks after the little ones, acts as a role model for them, as I act as a role model for him. He now has self-respect and a sense of purpose. I'm gonna go to my, see my friend in jail. What's happened to him? Uh, he's on remand right now for a couple things. You got a lot of friends in jail. Uh, what, jail? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not all of them, but most of them, yeah. Most of them. That's why East Side, you need it. You need the East Side. Get you away from all that, man. Have you been in? What? No, no, jail. No, I'm not going to jail. Never. I'm not going there. Touch wood, I'm never going there. But that's why I don't even go on the road no more. I just come east side, go home, stay home, go east side, come on. Yeah, it just keeps me off the road. Everyone thinks, oh, I can do it and leave when I want to. I'll make this much money and leave, or I will never do this. This, this is my limit, so I won't stab someone. But when the situation comes, you forget about everything, all your morals and stuff. And if someone's approaching you with a knife, you, you forget the fact that I said I will never stab someone because he's going to stab you, so it's kill or be killed kind of thing. You don't really have a choice. If I stayed on the road, I could have got, right now I could be in prison, basically. Just like, talk to Mr. List has helped me stay on the road, stay, stay off the road as much as I used to be. So if you go on the road, you just know you're going to get involved in stuff. Yeah, so that today, if I didn't, if I didn't come in today, yeah. well, they're going to chill with my dogs and a couple of my friends, and I would have got myself in trouble. Where we live, that's all we see. Drug dealers and cars and girls and shit. That's it, that's all we know. Oh, the, way I, the best way to put it would be swearing, but I'm not going to do that right now. You can, you, yeah. Bitches, all that, whatever you want to call it, yeah. But that's why we're here at Eastside, so the kids don't go on the road. Try and promote them, show them good things, and you have to be good at it. Or else you do go to jail, it's real. I was at a memorial service just a few weeks ago. This really good kid, David, was stabbed in the heart in his local park playing football. This is the park. I'm in my house now. You can see the park with me. This is the park. I will just open my window and call the children to call me. This is the park. I don't, it's in his home. It's more or less it's his home. Before you go out in the morning, he always, uh, we cuddle each other, we kiss me, we say, I love you, mommy. That's the, exactly what happened on the day. And at the evening time, it's, it's, uh, it's lying down helplessly. I can't help him. I can't do nothing. I can't cuddle him. I can't kiss him. I hold his hand. I'm just telling God, God, leave him for me. Don't take him. I'm just calling God, God, leave my son. Don't take my son. 
you know, I said, don't, don't take my son, Lord, don't take my son. I'm, you know, I'm just doing this so that all other parents will, will know how serious it is, you know. God, leave my son. Don't take him. Don't take him. Don't. He's going gradually. I hold his hand out. He's cold. I didn't leave him. Didn't leave his hand. So, even when the nurse come, that he's gone, Grace, he's gone. You know, I was still there. Yeah. Mm. The police officer came in um, on the on Thursday, and she said, "Oh, Grace, we caught the boy that stabbed your boy." Then I said to her, "I said, please go and deal with him. Whatever the law of the nation said about him, go and deal with him." Deep down, me, I know that that boy that stabbed my boy didn't know my boy. I know that something is missing. Because nobody ever know David want to start want to hurt him. The boy who killed him, a boy called Elijah, was only fifteen years of age. Violence was something that unfortunately Elijah grew up in. He was left to raise himself, and therefore his his family in if. It, According to him, his family were the young people on the streets who we would call a ga class as a gang. As far as he was concerned, they were his um, family and they had his back. They would support him um, as a family as we know it would do. But to this day, he calls me mum. And he, I do see him like, like my son. Biologically, I'm not his mum, he's not my son. But there's a, I will support him like any parent you will know what your child allows you to know. When they're out on the street, there's many things you won't know. So when I did hear about it at first, there was a part of me thinking, could it be true? Nah. Could he really have done it? But inside I thought, yeah, he could. Because I know where he's coming from. I know what he's experienced in his own life. To lash out and to, you know, inflict pain on somebody else. Yeah, I know he's capable of that. However, he has a mind of his own. So even if people are saying to him, do this, do that, he made a decision. Because the same way he decided to, do, to use that knife, he could have decided to say no. So he's got a mind of his own, so that's how I view it. I don't think our, this country, our country is very good at handling people who've gone off the rails. And I don't know what you do about it. I really don't. He has to serve a minimum of 12 years. Um, that's a minimum. I'd worked it out when, that he wouldn't be out to do about 28. The two mothers, David's, Elijah's, they have become really close friends and they work together to get rid of this dreadful problem of knife and gun crime that's plaguing our city. You know what? When David died, I didn't have any hate for, 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 the, for, for the young man that stabbed him. I didn't have any hate for him. You know, I'm not making an excuse for him, but I know there's a way that something pushed him to, to do that. You know, so I miss him so much. Talking about him is something that, that, that give me relief, that at least this is what he want me to do. Mm -hmm. Talk about him and to to, 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 to talk about the crime that is affecting everyone in the society. So, I still miss him a lot. I do miss him. I do miss him a lot. Mm. That's not sure. Mm. This street life kind of thing is rubbish. Like, you see what it's done. Like, if they're still alive, they've gone, like, they've served long sentences in prison and they've just come out and either they've realised all of that all those years trying to make money or, I don't know, get a name for themselves. It's either that it's all in vain because no one remembers it or they come out and prisons kind of twisted their mentality and now they come out worse than they were when they went in.
Amos joined his side when he was around 12, 13. At 16, he left to go to college, and so he wasn't at East Side as often. Within six months, Amos was doing two years for robbery. You can go to prison and they can make something better of you, or you can go to prison and come out a broken man, and you come out a broken person, a man, that's going to take years to rebuild. The way you don't put it as criminal world, real world, it's all the same world. We live all in the same place. Your next door neighbor could be a murderer. You never know that. You understand? Your next door neighbor could be a pedophile. You don't know that. It's the world you live in. So you can't say this world is there, this world is there. We all live in the same world. I've stopped caring about certain things. Like before, I'll be, I'll be sensitive about certain things. Mm -hmm. But now, nah, it, like, uh, it's like before I used to be, how do you put it? Like, you see something, you think, oh, I feel bad for this person, or oh, I feel mm. bad for this. Sometimes I couldn't care less. Mm. I don't know what it is, it's just that certain things that I, I think my heart's gone cold. Mm. Everything that's happening now is happening for a reason. And I don't think you can stop it. I don't think you can. Mm. Some of our children are in that position where they just don't have the means to survive even. And so they find an alternative. And then we lock them up. One of the many opportunities boys get at Eastside is the chance to apply for a place at some of the top private schools in the country. I think sometimes you don't know what you're opting for. I mean, nobody knows what it is until you're in. Look, ask any married person. Um, I think often you can gain the world and lose your soul uh, in some of these things if you're not careful. Rugby, a school in Warwickshire, that has taken five of our children, and each place is worth about 30 grand. Now, Anthony, he's been there, what, three months? And believe you me, rugby is not east side. This is our chapel. And we come, like I said, we come here on like, every other day. So it'll be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Sunday. My church is what they would call here, like a happy, clappy church. So it's like Pentecostal and stuff, and um, I was, it's like a big thing in my family. I don't know, it seems to be a, a sense of discipline in here. So it's like everyone comes in, everyone's quiet, and then we list, everyone listens, and everyone stands when, like, all in queue kind of thing. When I first came in, right, I just stood like, for ages, just looking around and just like, trying to, like, looking at all the details and stuff. I liked the whole idea because like, everyone was really happy for me, everyone was proud, and, and, uh, and he's going to rugby boarding school and stuff, and it was just like, it was really a big thing back home for me. And once I got here, I think, I felt like I had this massive pressure on my back kind of thing, like I didn't want to upset people, I didn't want to seem as though like, I'm just like, throwing away this opportunity. And um, so I tried really hard to like, just be this model student. I didn't feel like I was being myself. Things have happened since I've gone to rugby. When you're in rugby, like, you haven't, there's not a lot of people there that you feel knows you or you could talk to, so you can't kind of find your support at home kind of thing. So I, was, I speak to my mum a lot more now, and it's kind of, I don't know, it's bridged the gap, but like before I, didn't, I really didn't see eye to eye with my mum. Like I didn't think she could relate to me or understand where I was coming from. I see the kind of things that my mum has to go through. You know, she's a single parent, working two jobs, hopping from job to job. And it's all jobs where uh, I don't like to think about it because it's all jobs where she's been at, kind of at the bottom of the food chain. It's just hearing your mum getting upset because someone kind of talking down to her. 
And now it's not too bad because it's just three boys, but before it was my two older sisters and my sister had a baby. And it was all of us living under one house and it was just her to take care of all of us. The hard thing with Anthony is he loses his focus very quickly. No. If I show him the steps, da 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 da, and repeat that over and over again, mm. he can get it. Mm. But he's easily distracted and upset with what's going on at home. Yeah. And it does yeah. affect him here. Come on, Charles! Come on! Charles, come on! Charles is 16 and has been here for two years. He might well be brilliant at sports, but for me, the boy's playing the arse at the moment. Charles has broken the school high jump record. He's now jumped one, one, one metre 96, which is pretty remarkable for a boy of his age. He's fantastically talented. And that's been a real joy to see the way in which he's progressed. He'll be right up amongst the top people in the country for his age group now. So we're hoping that um, he will qualify for the English schools track and field finals, which are held at the end of this term. I look at getting into rugby as more luck than really anything else, because it could have been anyone or from anywhere, really, but luckily it was me. All of the teachers are involved and care about Charles, and this is what I keep telling him, Charles, you're getting chance after chance after chance. Yeah. It's, it's basic time management, yeah, being on. responsible, taking care of his belongings, his yeah. books, his sketchbooks for art, his supplies, you know, things like that. The problem with school is that you're with a bunch of 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, and it is a fun time. So getting down and settling to work is really hard. Yesterday, he comes barreling through the corridor eating mm. food during lessons. He had a bag of food, mm. and his tie's undone, new jacket he's wearing, completely messed up, stuffed on the side. I said, Charles, come on, son, get it together. We don't want you to fail. We want yeah. you to succeed and to go on and to do what you want to do in this world. And he says, Miss, I'm going to do better. I said, but Charles, I'm not seeing it. He's getting it wrong. What the fuck are you taking your fucking class for? Don't bother lying. People, uh... Don't people, I'm not talking to people, I'm talking to you. Is it all good news? Don't fuck about, tell me, is there any bad news? Because if I hear it, I'm not going to be pleased. You know what? I ain't got time for this, Charles. I really haven't. It vexes my soul. You know, I'm a bit like Jesus. I'm not interested in what you're doing when I get here. I want to know what you've been up to while I've been away. Well, Are your just... parents coming up? Yeah. I don't know why they're wasting their time. What are they coming up for? To do what? To speak to my teachers. Look, you need to speak to me. Because, uh, you know, unless I'm a man from Del Monte now, I'm bracing myself. I am bracing myself like a new inmate in, 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 in Wandsworth, because I don't know what's going to come. But I know that, you know, son, you know, that some kind of shower experience is on the way. It's important that you get used to other cultures, other people, other situations. And, that, and that's not, it's, it's not an, un, it's an uncomfortable thing. But there is no place else to learn except in the area of discomfort. No place else. I promise you, son, I promise you that when you get through this and you hold on to it, God will give you something that no man can take away. Now, I've essentially given it to the um, half term, but really, you know what, son? The money could be better used. That's where, really where we're at now. Um, so if you want to stay on, unless your mum and dad have got, you know, 30 grand each, then you need to start thinking, my God, I've got to catch up. Um, tell Miss Amy that um, yeah. whenever she's ready, she, um, I mean, it's her office, so I can't really tell her when to come and go, but... <laughs> I, I, the, the one thing that I've come away with from this morning um, is that we really do need to, um, and I need to, think about what the... F what the flip I'm doing um, in the lives of these children um, and see if we can get the benefit from um, the world of gent the gentry without uprooting our children, planting them and expecting them to grow in a soil that has a shit that don't stink quite like mine.
it's been a difficult journey at times and they have had to make quite an adjustment. I mean, at every sort of level. And I think it's interesting that in particular, the high aspirations and, and high expectations that we have in all areas, not just within the classroom, but outside the classroom. There have been some rocky moments, but all teenagers, there's very few who go through the long dark tunnel of adolescence plain sailing, but we are determined for their sakes that it's going to work. You're going to learn as much through disappointment and failure as you do through success. And that what I want for all rugbyans and for the Eastside boys, anyone, is at the age of 18 that they leave as confident young adults. I've tried my hardest not to change like, when I'm at rugby. I try and I'm quite <laughs> observant if my accent's changing or like just small things because I just don't want to feel like I'm not being true to myself. And I, although I don't live in the greatest part of London, I don't want to like be ashamed of it. I'm, I'm not ashamed of where I come from or because it's the best of, of like, what my mum could do. I've never really forgotten where I've come from and where my home is, to be honest. But I think to be successful, you have to change some things, but not forget who you are, but just try and encourage people around you to change as well. I had this perception that get a good education, pass your exams, and the world is your oyster. I think that's a lot of shit. Um, and I think it's shit because I think sometimes the so-called higher classes um, with their networks and their subcultures don't always let you in. Um, and, and, and one of my issues is what do you have to give up in order to be allowed in? Something very special in store for you tonight. So um, I don't want to give anything away, but I would recommend that you keep your voice warm. Some of them come here and, you know, they're not even supposed to be here on a particular day, but it's OK. Yeah, this is also their home. The greatest problem ESO has is that probably for half our kids, at least, they need us full time. If you let me go to that school and they tell me things about you that I don't know, I'm going to be pissed off. George Stone. I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to. I can't hear you. I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to. What's the score? Are you? Yeah. You are trying to do what you're supposed to do. Are you succeeding? It wasn't very nice when I got divorced. Um, and Alexander was really, really cut up about the divorce. I also ended up in rehab. You've been two relocations, talking in class. You're in your GCSE year. There should be no entries. A couple of times when Alexander's moved in with his dad and it's not worked out and he's come back here, lots of like confrontations with the wife. And then when, she, when they had a new family, it's sort of like Alexander's got pushed out a bit. So it's not been easy for him. I get the impression that you're not taking school seriously. I really do. If I can't trust you with little, how will I trust you with much? I think it's managed to give Alexander some sort of father figure. He does look up to Ray. You know, Ray actually calls him my son. And, um, and in, fact, in fact, I think at one time Alexander actually called him dad. Slip of the tongue kind of thing. It's me and you. 
I'm not pleased, Alex. I'm really not pleased. And I know you hit you hit it from me. I would never have heard about that but for your mother. There are times when Alexander's like, oh, I'm not going back there. And he goes, he goes back. He's all, he always goes back, you know. Gets up every Saturday and gets there, you know. So um, he's quite dedicated to the academy. Um, yeah, a sense of belonging, I think. Get out of my son. Oh, that's... I had to go into Daniel's school again. The headmistress wanted to see me because he was in trouble and we had to have another long conversation. What's important for us now is that Daniel needs to be far more discerning about his friendship networks and the people he associates with because he has something of a rep in school uh, and after a while you begin to live up to that mm -hmm. and live through that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, that is a road to hell. I think he needs something short and sharp. Um, not necessarily a prison sentence, but some kind of wake up. And I don't know what that looks like. If they wanted to kill him, don't know. They probably did. The for them to bashed. go, just for them to go to a neck shop, definitely. And they're banging him in the head with a hammer, Parish. I know, I know, sir. And he's lucky because when it happened, there was two nurses walking by. So then I think they helped him as well to keep alive, and then the ambulance came. So he knew he was going to a trouble. Yeah. He knew this that. It happens day in, day out, you know. There's so many boys that are involved in the gangs and in, in, involved in all this stuff. So when I heard, I'm, I, was, I was not surprised at all. Something, this is something that most of them see every day or have heard of, you know. It's, so that's why it's no, it's no sh shock to them. It's more of a shock to us, being older than them. This is what they go through every day. The problem is that the boys that were involved in this particular incident who have been caught, um, for them being caught isn't an issue, it's not something they're afraid of, in fact they're afraid of nothing, um, and they're happy to be caught, they're happy to go to prison because that then becomes a badge of honour for them, which gives them more credibility um, in their area, in their postcode area, and so it's not really, prison isn't a deterrent for them, and I don't really feel that... Um, the powers that be really understand what is going on on the ground level. You know, it's, it's a message for his error. That's what they're trying to do. But a message through to his error to try and show that they're serious. Isn't it? It's all gone mad. It's all mad. The children are wild now. People often talk to me about, you know, have we been successful? And I always hate that terminology. I really do. Um, East Side like most parenting um, and indeed schooling, you only know the results at the very end and often when it's too late to do anything about it. 
the East Side Boys are just like any other teenager. So we're delighted. And of course, the benefits are both ways. I mean, it's, it's good for our pupils, it's good for them. We will eliminate so much of the negativity that's going on. We will reduce the number of black youths in prison. We will reduce the number of stabbings going on in the street. Well, what I am able to say is that with some of our children, we make progress in terms of the fact that some of our children are not going to mug anybody. They're not going to hurt somebody. They're not, they, 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 for, for, for some reason, we've switched on the light that's marked alternative. We, we need to speak out now. We need to do something. Where do you belong, Alex? I'm more of the intelligent kind than the violent kind. The gang culture, as they call it, it's not for me. I think the people in the shires and the countryside and all the posh people, that's, that's where I should be, where I feel. Even though my life will ever turned out the way it was, there's things that I got from Academy which Regardless of whatever situation it is, I'll still use it in my day-to-day -day life mm. because it will help you. Mm. So I can't say it failed me because it's things I'll still use mm -hmm. for my life, you understand? It sounds weird, but you do look forward to going back to rugby because it just means that you don't have to deal with things that, not run away from it, but you just don't have to like, deal with it there and then it's not on your doorstep. So yeah, it is quite an escape. The aim is hopefully to just live a comfortable life. I just want to kind of move my mum out. I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure if I want to live in London after this. That's a dream. It's everyone's dream, I guess. There's always hope for everybody. It may take a bit longer, but there's always hope. As long as they're willing to stay with us, we will help. So you never give up on it? Never, we never give up. So that's us. That's his side story. Be the best you can be, he says. Well, we're trying, we really are.